So this talk tonight could transform your life for good. I know that looks a little bit weird when I say that, but they told me I have to have a punch sentence to start with though. Just to reassure you, I'll tell you that I haven't joined a sect or a cult. I didn't become a Buddhist monk and I'm not a guru trying to sell you some kind of recipe that you can apply and that will turn you young and happy for life. And I'm not a philosopher either. I haven't read uh, Spinoza or Socrates or any of these people. But tonight could really transform your life. And it may take a little bit more than 45 minutes for you to transform, but my goal is really to inspire you to embark on the journey. So during the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey so you understand where I'm coming from. I will introduce you to the project I created and I will propose you a recipe that you can follow or not follow to get a more fulfilled and a happier life. So the recipe is very simple. It's not expensive to fill. There's no risk, no side effect. It works in 100% of the cases. And contrary to learning how to play golf or kiteboarding, it has immediate positive effects. So the second you start, the second you start to feel better. But it's not easy to follow. And the reason for that is that it needs commitment. Each of us have the choice to live either an ordinary life or an extraordinary life. And chances that if we don't make that conscious choice, we will live an ordinary, ordinary life. And the reason for that is that we have been conditioned by education to look for certainty, safety, significance as our needs and to focus on achievement. Because there is no school in the world that preoccupy itself of the inner state of children or who focuses on the happiness of a child. When your kids go to school, they don't come back with homework on happiness, right? They focus on academic achievement. So that condition you in fulfilling those needs for certainty, safety, significance and achievement. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you make the choice of living an extraordinary life, you will fulfill all of these needs. And on top of that, you'll feel fulfilled, fulfilled and uh, happier. It's basically the choice between living and existing. Do you want to just exist or do you want to have a life? That's the concept of this project, is to help people making the conscious choice to live something extraordinary. So it's not about quitting the treadmill and then quitting your job, and it's about looking for something coming from more consciousness. So before we start, I'm curious on why you're here tonight. What made you come? And I wonder whether you would spend the next <coughs> 10 seconds to think of what made you come. Maybe you didn't read the invite, so you don't really know where you came from. And now you, that you found out, you wish you'd stay home or come home. Or maybe you didn't really want to come, but the idea of coming home was even worse than coming here. <laughs> Or maybe you just came for the dinner and then you felt that if you come here you can do a little bit of email during the lecture and that will kill the time. Or maybe you're interested in it. And it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you probably didn't analyze the reason why you're here. It was done subconsciously. But whatever your motivation is, your subconscious has likely set an intention for you tonight that will for the most part determine the outcome of this lecture. And that's the power of your subconscious. So if you become more conscious, then you can actually deal with these issues of intentions, of outcomes, 
And since you can't control the circumstances of your life, at least you can try to take over your subconscious life. So then you have a more conscious and more aware life. So before going further, I'd like to thank you for spending some time with me. You're going to see very soon that I'm really passionate about uh, this topic. I'm also interested in hearing your thoughts and your comments. So I'll talk for a short period of time and then I hope we can have a meaningful uh, interaction. And before I go to the journey of the last uh, two years, I'd like to share something with you that uh, you may not be aware of, but that had a, a huge impact on my current outlook on life. As for many of the people, my hyper-achiever personality came from craving for love and recognition when I was a kid. I thought that in order for me to have that recognition from my parents and that love, I had to be the perfect kid. The, you know, the A-plus student who does just about everything that's expected of him. So basically I became a nerd, the kid with the round glasses that nobody likes in class because he always gets good marks. And that uh, had an effect, uh, making me a little bit uh, awkward socially. But the good news is that by society criteria, it made me successful, right? If you get all of these achievements, then you get a good career and then you work. The difficulty is that while this was happening, there were some side effects. And if you ask my kids, they'll tell you their father was more a human doing rather than a human being. And if at that time I had been aware of my true values, not the one that my parents had for me or anybody else, I'm pretty sure I would have achieved the same success without the casualties along the way. And uh, if you fast forward now to more recent year, when I was still the chief in Toronto, had I known then what I know now, I'm convinced that the impact I have had on the people around me and the outcome of my leadership in Toronto would have been much greater. Because the message is really simple. There are things we can do to make our trip on the treadmills of life better. There are simple strategies that can transform our outlook on life and make us happier. In other words, we can keep our sanity we can raise our level of happiness without having to quit our job, lose a spouse, or alienate our children or our colleagues at work. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So when I stepped down from my leadership position about um, 18 months ago, I had a, a sabbatical year, as they say. So I wonder what I was going to do, where my passion was. And I realized that I was drawn towards the emotion that sustain successful leaders. So that's what I did. I was blessed that I could step off of the treadmill. I studied the psychology of happiness. I studied the research on uh, resiliency, vulnerability, courage, trust, love, compassion. And every one of these has a couple of top people in the world who spend their entire life studying positivity, mindfulness, and courage. Very impressive research. I also went to an accredited coaching school and I got certified and I have to tell you that changed my life. So you may ask yourself, what do you mean it changed your life? You still look like a radiologist to me. But for example, I became more conscious. I made fewer judgments. We had a discussion with the residents today on what it is that people make judgments in a few seconds on people. And I was really great at judging people. So I could walk in a room, assess the room, and within a few seconds, I had every one of the people in the room in a box. And once they were in that box, they behaved and performed according to the box because it was a custom made box. And what happened is that by making all of these judgments on people, you pretty much restrain their ability to contribute to your life to the size of the box. So in March 2003, I started a no judgment policy for me. And it's been fantastic to realize that a lot of people that I would have categorized, you know, the losers, the 
taker, the giver, the thing, in fact had way more to contribute to me and to society than what I thought from that box. So that's the kind of thing that can transform your level of consciousness and ultimately your level of happiness. And to give you a sense of how much I believe in the potential of this, I have decided I have decided to give up my job, pretty secure and stimulating job as a radiologist, also well remunerated, to launch this project that is still very much in its infancy and obviously has financial risks and uh, no security. So I think that's what you could call a calling. And happiness is not new. There's actually nothing I'm going to tell you today that hasn't been around for about 2,000 years. It just, it has been sought after for over 2,000 years. And thanks to the field of neurosciences, particularly neuroimaging, thanks to social networks, there's now a large body of scientific evidence that validate what the spiritualists, what the religious leaders, and what the philosopher have told us for thousands of years. It's everywhere, in the lay press, in the management uh, uh, journals, in the peer review scientific journals, in social sciences. There are exhibits on it. Government measures the level of happiness of their citizens to assess what their uh, social uh, policies are doing. There's one thing that has changed in the last 20 years is when I was raised, it was said that if you work hard, you'll be successful. And then if you work harder, you'll be more successful. And then if you're really successful, you'll be happy. And in fact, it's just the other way around. And there's now a number of studies that show this is not success that feeds happiness. It's happiness that, feels, that fuels success. Because when you're happy, your brain becomes more engaged more motivated, more creative, more resilient, and you're more productive, and therefore you're more successful. While when you just pursue success, and then you have a milestone, the second you have got the milestone, you're pushing it, and then you have to run again toward the new milestone, and then you have to run over, and then you'll die without having ever reached the stage where you finally can find happiness. So, you know, I'll be happy when I make a million dollars. I'll be happy when I get this paper published. I'll be happy when I get promoted to associate professor. I'll be happy when I be the chair. And guess what? You're the chair and you're still running after something. So that's success does not pro provide happiness, but happiness full fuels success. There's solid research evidence that show that happier people are healthier, they live longer, they have better relationship, they make more money, they're more creative, the immune system is better. And there's also very solid grounded research that shows that there are simple strategies that you can implement in your daily life that will raise your level of happiness significantly and sustainably, not something that will just last for a week. There are actually a lot of randomized clinical trials measuring different population and showing that. And besides this strategy, coaching is probably the fastest shortcut to personal transformation. It allows people to find out who they truly are and to shift their energy from this catabolic status, which would be the energy when you feel like a victim. You know, it's unfair what happens to you. So what do you do? You blame everybody, including yourself, or the status of being angry and defiant. You know, you basically punch me, I'll punch you back. And then you create this basically bully presence that just doesn't produce anything, but is draining, constricting, and basically using all of your resources for very little outcome. So if you can shift that energy, which is catabolic, to an anabolic energy, which is based on non-judgment, taking responsibility, and then reconciliation, forgiveness, compassion, then obviously 
you're focusing all of your resources to something that's building rather than destructive. And then you can be at the cause rather than at the effect of your life. So you guys are all some scientific background. So you're going to tell me, you know, if happier people get all of these perks, and then if it's simple to be happier, why aren't there more happy people in this world, right? And there are two, in my opinion, there are two reasons why they are not. The first reason is people are not aware of their blocks and they're not aware that they are actually strategies. They're so busy running on the treadmill with binders that they don't have a chance because all they care is to follow their conditioning from childhood, which is to be successful, to achieve at any cost. So there's nothing wrong with achieving, but if that's your only goal, then your chances is that you won't be as fulfilled as if in addition to achieving, you're looking for a more meaningful and fulfilled life. But the second reason is probably more important, is that happiness has to do with the soft stuff. The stuff you don't want to talk about because it's inside and you're afraid that it's going to make you vulnerable. And if you're vulnerable, then you think that you'll be weak and you don't want to be weak. So you feel safer hiding behind your screen on your smartphone or you feel your uh, uh, screen at work rather than having a meaningful, a meaningful conversation with your colleagues or with your children. And because we're not very comfortable with this inside job, we're actually not completely honest with ourselves. So if I ask you, if I ask myself whether I'm happy, you're going to tell me, of course I'm happy. I have a very stimulating, well remunerated, secure job that really I like. And then I have a good family. My spouse loves me. I have a look at these nice children. They go to private schools and I'm financially secure. So I am happy. That's fine. But then when you listen to the same people telling you that, their language is very, very drawn towards negativity. And there's a negativity bias already in our mind, but there's a disconnect between what we hear in terms of cynicism and behavior of people who have just about everything to be happy, but who focus their entire life on achievement without taking care of their own fulfillment. There's a say on psychology that positive emotions are like Teflon. They're very temporary because they don't stick on the pan. So you have one, poof, it's gone. While negative emotions, they're like Velcro. You get them and they're going to stick to you for an hour, a week or life. So you need to have way more positive emotions than negative emotions if you want the ratio to be balanced. So when we talk about our level of happiness, we talk about our level of achievement. But all of these negative emotions that are sticky like Velcro and that are there making us ruminate for sometimes months at a the time, they are basically eating us from the inside and responsible for our lack of uh, fulfillment. Just think of the last time you had an evaluation and then someone just went through it. Like I used to get a 360 every year as the chairman. And every year it was a nightmare because you get all of these nice comments and then there's one comment that said that whatever, you could do better. And what do you do? You're just going home and you ruminate with it and you make the life of everybody around yourself miserable because someone had the guts to tell you that you were not God. But all of these compliments you got, just like Teflon, they didn't stick. You don't even remember. You don't even know you had them. And that's what we do. We go through life not even recognizing the positivity that's all around us. But if we train ourselves to look at these, what are called micro positivity moments, then you can 
have more and more of them and they may last 10 seconds or 15 seconds. So they're not going to decrease your productivity at reading CT. But if you learn how to see them, to savor them, to enjoy them, to absorb them, then you can really rewire your brain towards positivity rather than being stuck with these negative emotions that come to you and that stick like Velcro sticks. So let's look at one example of the inner stuff, the kind of thing that people don't want to look at. Trust, you know, why does my grandkid can jump without even looking at whether there's someone there and then my wife has to jump too to grab him and look at his face. He has absolutely no qualms that someone's going to pick him up. You wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that because I would worry. Does, is there someone going to pick me up? So let's look at the circle of trust. Let's make a little exercise and I promise it won't make you uncomfortable. So you're going to have a little uh, uh, green card here and I won't give you access to the US, but if you take the pencil with it and think that on the ranking of trust, one would be, you've got to be kidding, I cannot trust you. Two would be, I have guarded trust. Three would be, I'll share some personal stuff with you. Four would be, I trust you mostly. And five would be, I have complete trust with you. What I'd like you to do is you turn towards your neighbor. So look. Look at them in the eye for five seconds and mentally, you don't have to say anything, and mentally I'd like you to rank that individual from one to five. You don't write anything, just look at the one sitting next to you or behind you and see whether this individual is the one, two, three, four or five, okay? Um, you can do behind. You pick. You can look at me. You can look at me. Okay, so five seconds. Look at the individual and decide whether you would rank them. You do that mentally from one to five. And because that's mentally, you don't have to pretend anything. Okay. No, you just, that's the appetizer. So the main course is, now I'd like you to think of the six or seven people who you are working the most closely with. They don't have to be MDs, like could be your assistants, they could be trainees, they could be people working closely with nurses, technologists, that people you have to rely on. So mentally, think of six or seven and one by one, I'd like you, I would like you to plug their initials on that circle of trust. So let's say I work with someone whose initial is MA and I trust that individual mostly, then I would put MA on near the four. And then if I would go to the next one, do that with five or six or seven people for the next two minutes, if you feel like it. You can do anything you want, Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> we all had to pick a character to be earlier today, like uh, something, like an actor. Or and, and your what do you mean? I just paid you a compliment. Yeah. Take yeah. it. Okay, so five or six or seven people who work with you very closely, just take the time of putting the initials on, and then you're going to have a histogram, right? Of either they'll be all five or all one or in between, and maybe you'll have a Gauss curve. And you don't have to share that with anybody. This is just a mental exercise. And the reason why you hesitate even to write something is because this is inner stuff. This is the soft stuff. This is the stuff we're uncomfortable with because we're afraid it's going to make us vulnerable and we've been taught, I don't know how and why, that vulnerability makes us weak. This is just for co-workers in our work environment, right? You could do the exact same thing at home if you're more 
comfortable. The key is just to get you to step out of the sandbox and look at the sandbox and look at which emotions you trigger by thinking of the trust. We did a few different tests with the residents today about trust and it has nothing to do with them, right? It's whether you trust them or not. It's, it's not about them, it's about you and your ability to actually face an emotion that be, can be positive or can be negative. If you get all one, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just like you work in an environment where you don't trust the people you work with. Okay? Is there anybody who wants to share their histogram? Go ahead. Don't give me the name, just give me the numbers. I'm, I'm mobilizing more to be between two and three. Okay. Anybody has only five? I was going to say you're delusional, but I can't do that. That's Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody has only one? I guess my sense is most people would have a sort of curve, right? So now what I'd like you to do is think of these five, six or seven people and think of where you rank on their circle of trust. So if they were asked, where do I rank this individual on my circle of trust? Where would you be? Would you be five? Would you be one? Would you be two or three? How do they trust you? Because you see, trust is a reciprocal emotion. So even if you're very trustworthy, we dissected trust like the whole afternoon. So if you have everything to be trustworthy, if you cannot really trust or you have difficulty to trust people, they won't trust you because people work with neuron mirroring. So when they try to connect to you, they won't look at whether you're worth their trust. They will see that you don't trust them. They'll sense that. That's the intuition, that's the inside job. So because they will feel that you don't trust them, they'll have a difficulty to trust you. And then we can go deeper. We can spend a full week on trust. You could say whether everything you just did was to trust them with your credit card, your wallet, or whether it was to trust them with your emotions and on and on and on. You can go very deep on the trust. Now you could imagine what your life would be if the trust of the people you ranked on your circle of trust were all five, like you were all like Andrea, and you were working with people you trust 100%. How more productive would you be? How more of this weight that we always have when we don't know. You know, I have had tons of experience of real trust. There are people in my life who about 10 years ago asked me to send them a check for pretty much 80% of my assets to buy whatever company or something. They were friends of mine, but I had no clue of where they were going to meet them. I was uh, somewhere in Tannen on a sabbatical. And the next day I sent a check because I had so much trust that I didn't know even what they were going to do with it. On the components of trust, there's the integrity and the intent on one side. And I had full feeling that I could trust the integrity and the intent. And the other side of trust, you have the competence and the results. And I knew these people would make results with that money. And actually that's probably the best investment I've ever done in my life. So that's the one thing. And then I have had other experiences in other parts of my life where all day long I had to work looking behind me because I was going to be stabbed in the back. And when you reach my age, it's hard to turn your freaking head because your neck is blocked all the time. So when you do that day in and day out, it doesn't improve your productivity, right? Because you're constantly using most of your resources to protect yourself. So you're permanently in this level of catabolic energy. Either you're angry because you kind of know it's going to stab you, but you can find them because you can turn your head properly, or you're in the victim mode. Why are they always after me? So trust 
is a pretty important thing. And if you can trust the people who work with you, then life is a piece of cake. I, I used to run this uh, department at uh, these uh, things in Toronto. And the overall budget, if you added the practice plan income plus the hospital budget, was about $100 million a year. I have no freaking clue how to run a $100 million operation. Like, it's way beyond. And it was a piece of cake because I trusted the directors. And then we had one guy in the practice plan. And I trusted that if there was anything there that would require to be worried, he would tell me. So with two people, that were five on my list, I could manage very successfully a hundred million dollar operation without having any clue of what it was doing about. That's what trust can do. Trust made of competence and results. It's not just like they were trying to meet the budget. They were doing it every year. I never had in my entire career, I never came under budget, except for some reason that were doing it deliberately. So I, they were competent and providing results. And then the integrity and the intent was also trustworthy. Yes? Trust has to be earned now. And in my opinion, it's very hard. It, it, there needs to be a, there's a time, there's a, a, an exposure to an individual or a group of people who you get to, to see how they perform and how you interact with them. And, and it's earned. It's something that, that resonates and then you eventually realize that uh, you can contrast mm -hmm. to whatever degree. So, so, yeah, trust is never carte blanche. So the first time you meet an individual, and we did a little test where you meet people that you've never met before, you look them up in the eye and you tell them whether you trust them or not. So they haven't earned anything yet, you don't know them. Yeah. But still you know, and how do you know? Because you do a body check, and that body check creates a body reaction in you. And you know in your body reaction whether you're going to give them the initial trust. Now, the first day, you may not give them <laughs> the check with 80% of your assets, but you're going to see whether there's hope there that it's going to grow or not. But aren't we full of biases in terms of uh, mm -hmm. We do. Physical appearance, the clothes they wear. Uh, we do have biases, but if we're more aware and we practice this awareness of who we are, which values are truly our values? How do we recognize them in other people on the intuition? The, the least we focus on, their sto on the story around everything, and the more we focus on the emotions behind the story, the more astute we'll be, and not astute like IQ, but the more we will be able to trust our intuitions. Because the first thing, if you want to trust any other people, you have to be able to trust yourself. And if you want to raise your self-trust, there's one very simple thing. Make commitments to yourself that you will fulfill. So if you say, I'm going to exercise seven days a week, an hour and a half a day, you're going to lose trust in yourself pretty quickly. But if you say, I'll exercise 10 minutes a day, three days a week, you're going to do it. And then you're going to increase your self-trust. And then you go more. So do to yourself what you expect other people to do but make commitments that you can fulfill. Don't, don't do things that are going to decrease. You said you have people who are competent and, and you trust them with you know, managing the hospital budget. That's only if you have people who are competent and you trust them. When you're talking about you know, catabolic energy looking behind your back. Competence is part of the trust. trust. Right, but if you don't have those people you can trust who are around you, you will still look back and, and make uh, sure nobody's having yeah, your back. Yeah, the key right? is not to be, <laughs> have me. The key is to give trust when it's going to work, right? When it's going to work, when it's not going but to work. But if it's not going to work, you will learn how to work with people that are untrustworthy. And there are also techniques about it. And sometimes you don't trust. And, you know, there are lots of things that you trust people for some things. I would trust you with my credit card, but I wouldn't let you take my gallbladder out, right? Because you have no competence there. So it doesn't matter whether you are full of integrity. You're just not good at that. And there are people, they're so good at trying, but they never get results. Well, I probably would not hire them because it's good to try a lot, but if they never get results, 
they're not trustworthy for that competency. Yes? Yeah, I, I agree that trust, I don't think, I agree with most of you say, but I don't think trust is a good word to describe what you're saying. Because uh, I trust my wife for a lot of things. She takes care of my kids. She is good in many, many things. She looks after my bills. And, but I would never trust her driving. That's what, that's what I'm saying. You trust people for something. There is no trust with a capital T. Dealing with other people, with other people, is not a matter of trust. It is more, something more logical, more positive. It's a matter of betting on people. Uh, that is quite different. It's a matter, matter of betting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even uh, every everything is tell you that this person is uh, brutal, vulgar, a liar. Uh, the worst thing you can think of, you still bet that there is something good in that person. Mm -hmm. Even if you talk to a group of people, uh, and uh, most of them are really not understanding, not really human beings, you have to bet that there is one or two there that will, will listen to you. This is what I, is a better saying, what you call trust, to me is this feeling of guessing there is some residual of human being in everyone, even in Heitman, even in uh, Hitler. I don't know. That's too much. Okay, not Hitler. But, <laughs> uh, but so yeah. just a second. There is a beautiful page of Simon Weil, the philosopher, the, the Catholic, the Jewish. She said at the beginning, the first page, uh, the good Samaritan goes <laughs> along the street and sees that the guy that is completely almost dead, blood. Is a slave, is not able to think, is not able to talk, is not able to be a human being. You, you see nothing is, as a human being there, but you still help him because you guess, you bet that there is a human being there. It is like you, are, you become like God because you create a human being with your trust, with your. That's, yeah. That's compassion. No, I, I hate compassion. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, sorry, I took too much time. No, no, it's very fun. So what's wrong with compassion? Compassion is bad because uh, compassion means same passion, same feeling. And uh, here there is a, a lot of use of this word, which is misleading. You need to be compassionate with your patients. That's impossible, is hypocritical, is a lie. Because if you are there, you sympathize with your patient, at the end of the day, you go to the movies, he go, I go to the he restaurant, to he goes to OR having his leg chopped off, etc., or something like that. Okay? Or the portion of liver removed. So you cannot feel, he has belly ache, you cannot feel the same ache. You, it's the same passion, the same pain is impossible. His to passion feel. with is not the same. Cum? Mm, together. Cum with? With. Yes, with, forget, yeah. Not the same. We'll talk at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read them all, but I've read some. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, you are good. <laughs> so now let's talk a little bit about the vision. When I realize how much transformation I could achieve just adopting these simple techniques, I felt I would become a, you know, a, a mentor and a coach for leaders like people like you and me. And then that's when something didn't work for me because I realized that if I wanted to be meaningful on bringing, you know, more awareness, consciousness that will lead to joy and fulfillment, why would I reserve that to a very small elite group? Because in my book, a leader is someone who gets results by inspiring trust. So. Whether you lead an organization of 5,000 people or whether you're the leader of your family of four or just the leader of yourself, this is the same thing. The leader is how do you inspire people? So that's when this transformation project came in. And then I was thinking about 20 years ago, I helped creating a shift in radiology with this PAX transformation. And the way it happened is we created tools and then we made them available to everybody on the internet. And that created a shift in the industry that we still perceive today. And what our industry needs today 
is a shift in awareness that will lead to more fulfillment and more happiness for its members. Because if you transform a physician, you get the ripple effect of everybody that they're going into contact with patients and colleagues. And if you transform a tech, you get the exact same ripple effect. If you transform the people who, the receptionist, you have the same ripple effect. So by touching one person, you get many. And this awareness campaign that uh, I'm doing right here now is meant to basically inspire people. And this is a bit like adoption of a new technology. When you get a new technology, you get people who are ready for it. You know, you're ready for your iPhone 6. So you're just going to get it because you're fed up with the system and you know there's something more than this treadmill. Although it is a pretty damn good life, you know there's something more. So you're ready to transform and that's what I would call the early adopters. And the majority of people, they just listen and then they'll just follow and wait to see how these things goes. And then there are people who are more conservative and then it's like planting a seed and then it will grow. But those people who transform because they were already ready, what's going to happen to them is the more they're transforming, the more they'll be happier. A lot of people say, what's in it for you in this project? And what's in it for me is the number of people I transform. Because the more people get happier, the happier I get. It's the concept of the two for one. If you give money to a shelter, it gives a sense of purpose. You help people and you know on the five pillars of happiness, there's positivity, there's engagement, relationships, meaningfulness and achievement. So the purpose gives you the meaningfulness, something that's bigger than you. You help someone by giving money to a shelter. But you don't need the shelter, you have a house. So you just give and by giving you get something, but you don't get the gift. If you transform someone's happiness by giving them happiness, you give it back because of this neuronal connection. So you get a two for one. You get it when you give it and then you receive it again. So that's a pretty good deal. And then from a purpose, it can become your purpose. So I think the ripple effect is what is going to create this transformation that our industry really needs. So now, let's stick this one. What determines your level of happiness? People are always uh, shocked to realize that your environment thinks that happens to you. Your liver removed and chemotherapy or whatever bad things or good things happens to you is only responsible of 10% of your level of happiness. Very, very, very little. Stuff that you may change, that the 40% and this genetic, which is more a sort of family pattern than a real genetics, is a big chunk of your happiness. So your circumstances are really negligible in your level of happiness. So it's not linked to your circumstances. So what can you do? Well, you can practice micro moments of positivity. You know, when we were talking, there was this big noise. And you know what this big noise is? It's the birds that kicks. And that bird, I don't know very much about, but it's a really pretty one. It's all red. And it's <laughs> so I looked at it. Cardinal. And that was a micro moment of positivity for me. How long did it last? Maybe 10 seconds. But a year ago, I would not even have seen it. I would say, oh, this noise is going to mess up his tape. Now I looked at it. I don't really care about whether it messes his tape or not because he can remove the noise. But I had a beautiful bird in front of me for 10 seconds, 5 seconds. So that's what is a psychologically the heal process. It means have the positivity 20 times during the day at least 20 times you are crossing a micro moment of positivity and probably you're missing quite a few of them so if i had one suggestion for you to do tonight between tonight and tomorrow night is count the micro moments of positivity that come your way learn how to recognize them and then when you have them that's the h enjoy them, enhance them. I'll give you an example because it's going to happen in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. 
The best part of a glass of red wine is the first sip. I don't know whether you ever realize that. This is the best by far. When you take the thing and you get the first sip of red wine, this is when it fills your mouth. And then it, your mouth is all rotten anyway because it's, it's done, like it's filled. So all my life, I used to drink wine like the French people, right? You know, a glass after the other. So I never had this micro moment of positivity because I never had the first sip. I always had three sips at a time. My wife calls it the gusto or disgusto. So that's a moment, micro moment of positivity. So if you drink several glasses, you have one moment of positive per glass. <laughs> if you drink a glass of water in between. I drink espresso coffee. I, I do a lot of things related to food. I don't know why. You know, the espresso coffee, the little foam on top of it, that's the only part that's really good in the, in the, in the espresso. The rest is really like coffee and it doesn't even have as much caffeine. So if you have the positive moment when you take your espresso and then you enhance it, you savor it, and then you absorb it, you take the time to step out of the experience and watch it coming into your brain. So if you have enough of those, they will counteract the negativity. And the L stands for link it. So once you're good at it and you can practice and it's not going to decrease your productivity at work because all together it's probably going to be a good three minutes in your day. But three minutes made of 20 times 10 seconds or 15 seconds. So it's going to change your outlook on life because you will realize that there's a lot of good stuff. Yes, it's cold. But so I could say, you know, it's cold here and I don't even have a coat. In fact, if I don't have a coat, it's because I never wear a coat after March 1st. But when you took me and his car is heated, I looked at, it was beautiful. We passed some kind of river and bridge and the light. I got my six or seven moments just by that and other little things like I didn't tell you, you know, I don't ring the bell every time I get one. <laughs> but <laughs> you could. And you would be surprised that the bell would ring in your department all the time. If every one of you was ringing a bell, every time they have a micro moment of positivity, you would have much more positivity moments than negative ones. But the negative ones, they're like Velcro, they stick. And they're just like a savings account. So when you have them and everything is good in your life, you don't need them. My life is fantastic. So this bird, I put it in my RSP, my saving account, because I don't need to use this today because I have a good life. I'm having a good time with you. So when things go bad and then I need chemo or my liver removed, I'll have a bunch of stuff in my saving account of multiple micro moments of positivity that I can use as a voucher against the bad stuff that's going to hit me one day or the other. So you see, this is just becoming conscious that things are there. And what I told the reason, it's not that the glass is half empty or half full. It's not that you have to say, well, life is good. I'm just, you know, like uh, living in a delusional world. It's not the glass, it's that there are other reality that you can look at because next to the glass, there's a pitcher of water that could fill the freaking glass. So this practice, Technique, simple, just record for one day or more, whatever, your moments of positivity. Engage your brain, activate them, and then rewire your brain with the positivity because there's just so much space. So if you put lots of positive stuff, there'll be less space for the negative stuff. And then practice being present. And I never understood this being present, like, I'm still struggling with the human doing versus human being because what happens is I'm a passionate guy. So when I do something, I do it. Five years ago, I went to juicing. I don't know, I bought a juicer, <laughs> I thought it was good. I bought 12 juicers. Every one of my kids, my parents, my best friend, they all had to have a juicer and I was checking with them that they were juicing. <laughs> so now I'm on happiness. My kids are freaking out. They say, this is the juicing happening again. <laughs> He's going to want us to be happy. <laughs> so 
I'm learning the being present, right? It doesn't come naturally to me. But you know how to do it. You know what? Because I've been lecturing all over the world on the stupid cystic tumors of the pancreas. And every lecture I give, there's always a third of the people who are either on their phone or asleep. And you've been here with me for 45 minutes and you haven't checked your cell phone. You have been present. It's amazing. Have you ever been to a lecture for 45 minutes and where everybody is present? That's what being present is. So what I'd like you to engage you now, if you give me two minutes, we're going to talk for mindfulness and meditation. Because what kills us in, at work is the lack of focus. We constantly wonder. There's a wonderful study coming from Harvard that I participated in too as a subject. It's a social network study. So they send you emails all the time during the day and you have to tell them what you do and whether your mind is wandering and whether you're happy. And there's always a questionnaire. They say, are you having sex? Are you happy? Blah, blah, blah. And they say, you know what? If I was having sex, I wouldn't check my freaking email. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they never caught me for almost three weeks. <laughs> Finally, they got me while I was having sex. So good for me. I thought I wouldn't pass. <laughs> and they found out that people, their mind wanders for 47% of their awake life. If you're interested, I'll send you the study. 47%. At least 30% of every activity except lovemaking. So whatever you do, your mind is not where you are for at least 30%. And then they found out that when people's mind is wandering, they're less happy than when they focus. What's the best way to focus is to be mindful. So I'm curious, how many of you meditate? How many of you have never meditated? Okay, so let's do an experiment. It lasts exactly two minutes, okay? I'm going to put a little bit of music and this two minute meditation and just hear the tape and do whatever you want to do. Welcome to this two minute pause in your day. Allow your eyes to close and bring your palms to rest on your thighs. Begin to consciously notice your back. Sense where you feel contact between your back and the chair or cushion. Let your shoulders relax. Focus now on your chest and heart area, noticing any sensations there, letting any tension begin to melt away. Become aware of your breathing and the rhythmic rise and fall of your chest. Two minutes. Okay, I don't want to push my luck. You haven't touched your little devices and I don't know how much you can. 
I see some of them like starting to agitate themselves. So what I suggest is that it's time now to pull your device out. So please take your phone out or whatever you're using, if you feel inspired to do so. And if you want me to send you some of compilation of the research I have on all of this stuff or some of uh, the things that we've discussed, then just send me an email at patrice at patricebread.ca. And then in the subject, you just have to put Happy London. And then I have, so if you want to use text, you can also use my text message. And then if you want a piece of paper, then you can put that on a piece of paper because there's not just one way to communicate. And, and if you're inspired, you could, on the message, you can put your first name or your last name, and then you can answer that those questions. Do you believe it's possible to increase your level of happiness? So just don't type the question, just say one to five because I'll read your message in order. So if you believe there's value in increase, it's a possible thing to do, just put five. If you think, you know, we're stuck with whoever we have come at birth, just put one. And then the next question would be, do you believe you can increase your level of happiness? In other words, the first question is generic. The second one is up to you. The fourth question, so you just say on the fourth question, Y, N or M, if your interest on the topic has increased, that would be a Y, no, N and maybe M. And then the fifth thing is if you're interested in me sending you some articles on the topic, you put a Y and if you don't want it, you just put N. And then if you're interested, what I do is, if you're interested, I'll send you a challenge of counting your uh, positivity or something where for four weeks you'll commit yourself to write one really nice email to someone a day. Just something that you write an email to someone, a nice email. Because the thing is, if you do that, not only that guy will feel better, that person, but you'll feel better. So that will be a moment of positivity. We talked a lot this morning about smiling. It's amazing what smiling can do. So if you're interested, you just put yes. And then if you have any questions that you want to ask me or any feedback for my personal benefit, feel free to do so. So there's lots of other things I'd like to do, but I'm conscious of the time and I'm going to stop here. And then if you want to talk now or later during the evening, I'll be pleased to, because one of the things I'm desperately trying to learn is how to listen. So I'll shut up from now.